Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here today with you and with our artist of the moment. We're celebrating Jamie Wyatt. I just want to let you all know uh, in this packed house that you're obviously not alone in Boston. Over 85,000 people have now seen the exhibition since it's been open about eight weeks. You. So, you're the one. Jamie, we thought we'd start right in a little bit and, and get you started at the beginning with the story that began in Needham, Massachusetts, with your grandfather, N.C. Wyeth, and we have on the screen a painting you did of the interior of his studio in Chad's Ford, which is open to the public as part of the Brandywine River Museum of Art now, and N.C. Wyeth painting in his prop-laden studio. I hear you had a chance to go visit his home. So I did. We had a wonderful time last night. Phyllis and I were going to dinner in uh, Newton, I guess it was, and so I... I had gone to the, my grandfather's uh, homestead uh, as a child with my father, so we drove there just as it was getting dark, and there was the house, my great-grandfather's house, and then next to it I recognized was the Andrew Wyeth house, they called it, which I thought was sort of strange, and it, it, of course, N.C. Wyeth used that for the uh, Admiral Benbow Inn in Treasure Island, so I was stumbling around, and out this poor guy came and said, can I help you? And, and I said, well, I'm a grandson, my grandfather, and oh, you couldn't have been nicer, and took us all around down to the Charles River, and then his young daughter came down, and they introduced, and I said, well, I hope you're not bothered by Wyeth ghosts, and she said, I'm waiting for your ghost to come to my room. <laughs> That's great. Well, it turns out we had in this group of slides the um, Admiral Benbow Inn in the back of Old Pew, and I just wanted to back up just a little bit to show people. Yes, this that, house oh, sorry. is in Needham. Uh, that that's he used as the inn in, in the story of Treasure Island, which always fascinates me about N.C. Wyeth, my grandfather, who I never knew. He died before I was born. But he created all these things in his mind. You know, he never traveled to England, never traveled to Scotland, never traveled to the Caribbean for Treasure Island. It was all in his head, which is fascinating. And he seemed to have used, of course, a lot of... Oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way props in the studio here surrounded by them and that seemed to be something you loved visiting with. Well, as a child it was just magical. I mean, I'd wander up and and here was this huge empty studio with all his costumes and cutlasses and, and then a lot of the illustrations were still there in stacks. So I would spend just hours going through these things and then of course I'd wander down to our home where my it was my father's studio, and there would be my father painting a dead crow in a field. I mean, it was <laughs> totally uninteresting to me. And, uh, but I did, the, the wonderful thing is this studio is now open yes. for limited visiting, and now we've given my father's studio, and for young people particularly, to go to a place where within these walls these images and wonderful paintings were created, and they see it, and it's very, the NCY studio is very sort of big scaffolds for his painting murals. And, and then you go to the Andrew Wyeth studio, and it's just four empty walls. And outside of it, so I had, I skipped over, so NC's picture and then one of the illustrations for Robinson Crusoe that was, actually this is an oil painting that was initially on the cover, and then... This was the cover of the, the book, and when the book actually came out in London, and um, Scribner's, I think it was Scribner's, whoever, the publisher came to my grandfather and said, children are frightened by that cover. <laughs> you have to change the image. And so he did a rather bucolic thing of Crusoe talking to his parrot. But this, I think, is the incredible painting. And that book is so rare now. And I bought this painting last year at Christie's auction. It's, it's a fabulous, exciting. fabulous seascape, yes. <laughs> Uh, but this this one, so you mentioned your father's studio, and then outside in the great room is your own studio that you can now visit as, as it was set up as when, when you I were working. When I was very young, I worked there and set up my own sort of little thing. And I happened there, they've done, this is where I did the portrait of President Kennedy when I would travel with the brothers, and I'd come back with all the drawings and created this world there. The only drawback was my father was a person, when he painted, he loved music. And I love music, but I find it distracting when I work. And the Victrola, the record player, was in that room. So he'd have Bach and Sibelius just crashing. I'd have to stuff cotton in my ears and whatnot. And two different ways of working. Definitely. And I think this uh, is interesting because where people often forget that physically when you sit and paint a painting, you're within arm's reach. And then you often, here you are, set up using this mirror to look at it from a longer distance away so that you can get a sense of it. And here are the drawings That's reflect. Longer, but also... When you work on something so intensely, which I tend to do, you want to look at it with a fresh eye. So 
the reflected image gives you sort of as if you're looking at a different painting and you can sort of see things you wouldn't that you're after working on a painting for a month. I mean, I'll go creep by the outside of a house and peek through a window at the painting, and just to give me sort of a, a more objective look at it. And then I also wanted people to see on this windowsill, as it's set up in the, where you can visit today, all these little soldiers of your father's that are mm. all lined up there, which he had about 2,200, it's, or what they tell us. Like yes, they, at the museum. and I carry it on, the interest in miniature things, and, uh, and certainly my father uh, had, I don't think my grandfather, had miniature things, but my father definitely. And if you look at his paintings, they're all miniature worlds. You know? Definitely. Well, it so sounds it like your sense. grandfather went for the full scale cutlasses yes, and everything exactly. else. Um, so we, so over the on this side of the screen where he, we, where you just saw Jamie was painting um, the portrait of John F. Kennedy. Here's uh, the N. C. Wythe painting and reproduction of it hanging over the fireplace. The one but you as see a child, here. that hung there. I mean, the the, the painting of Blind Pew there as I was working there, so it was rather intimidating. But, uh, but I find it so fascinating, N.C. Wise's work, in the fact that he knew these things were going to be reproduced in the book this big. Why did he do these paintings enormous? And, but the reason he did, he wanted them to jump out of the book and grab you by the neck. And it did. I mean, this one really just, does. Uh, you know, mortified, and, and, but, but excited. And, and, and I was given by my grandmother, actually. Again, as I say, I was born after my grandfather died. She gave me the books that Scribner's would send him, which were unillustrated, and as he would read, he'd do the little notations and things. Oh, and, and he always chose a scene just after an event or just before, not the sort of gun smoke and clashing thing. So it, it was provocative to people. and. Uh, and it, and it resonates today. I went, um, this was actually about 30 years ago, the New York Public Library owns all the Robin Hood and mm -hmm. Kidnapped, and so I went to the opening, and they decided all oh, these, these paintings were a little valuable, we had to clean them up, and so they restored them and, and asked me to come to this thing, and I was standing there, and this little woman was wheeled up in a wheelchair, and she must have been in her 90s, grabbed my hand and said, oh, Mr. Wyeth, I'm so thrilled to meet you. I grew up on your illustrations of Robin Hood and Treasure <laughs> Island. <laughs> so I thanked her very much. And said, <laughs> We're glad you're so youthful. Yeah. Uh, so I think in the show, one of these wonderful drawings of the 1100, I'm always so impressed that your mother saved and annotated over 1100 of your drawings uh, from the ages of three on up. So this is one from the age of five. And you seem to be absorbing this wonderful dynamism of the center of the composition being relatively empty with the small figure sledding and those of the boys making yeah, snowmen. Were, I was sort of drawing my life, but the people said, well, when did you really get serious about painting? Well, I was serious when I was five and six. That's all I wanted to do. And that's why I left school. That's why I have continued on. And luckily, it still exists, you know. But, but these early drawings were like any child. I would read a book and or go sledding with my friends and do the drawings. They're fantastic, so we're so thrilled. And then we have uh, your grandfather, here's Treasure Island. This is an actual oil painting that mm. was reproduced in the end papers for one of his famous early books of the 112 that I, I'm always astounded at that number of books that he would have illustrated so many. Was it really 112? 112, yeah. and to think of each book having to distill, as you mentioned, with the scenes, it's, right. it's a huge amount. But this is such a dynamic image in paint and in the end papers. And this was the real seminal book when he really took off. I mean, he'd studied with Howard Pyle, who was a leading illustrator of his time whose paintings I think are wonderful in the illustration, but they're very small in size. And then N.C. Wyeth was given this commission to do Treasure Island by Scribner's, and Maxwell Perkins was his editor. And so he did these enormous sort of colorful things, which is a real departure from Howard Pyle, and it was a wildly popular book with his illustrations. So then he went on to do all the classics and so forth. I think this one is so unusual. It looked to me as though he later painted the yellow on top of this monochromatic image, at least looking at it at the Brandywine where it hangs, and these dynamic shadows, and the way he cuts the horizon in the, in the way that these pirates are storming across, it gives them that real energy, yeah. I think, through the center. Well, actually, Elliot, I have, my grandmother gave me a little canvas that has just barely the figures moving across, done very quickly in oil, 
and NC was written on a first mark for Treasure Island. That's fabulous. That was his first idea. For the, and it was a great idea, area. obviously. He affected so many people. And we have in the show these dynamic images that... And have... there I am, stealing. You know, I have a quote from Pablo Picasso in my studio, which says, mediocre painters copy, great painters steal. <laughs> and so... <laughs> Well, these are very different from your grandfather, of course. Um, Orca well, Bates, a favorite model, but again, there's... Pretty informed by. <laughs> no, but I think, I think uh, you know, the, the harpoons and the... It's just so dynamic with the yellow. They just really stand off. And uh, using it for Nureyev and the monochromatic use of graphite there. Well, is with Nureyev, I didn't want to do... I mean, obviously, it was sort of odd me painting a dancer because, of course, he was constantly moving. And of all the things I did, and this has the most movement... And it was a, a, a ballet, uh, Don Quixote, which he choreographed. And, uh, and, of course, in the original thing, he's a cobbler, somebody. He makes himself a prince, of course. And, and this whole thrust, if you look at the figure, is really what the ballet is about. I mean, that, to me, sort of... And, and he agreed when he saw it. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. Now, another figure in the story, your Aunt Carolyn, whom you trained with after you left school at age 11, when you convinced your parents you should spend more time in the studio in one of her works here. And I think she's such a fascinating character due for a lot Amazing. more work yeah. uh, in terms of art history. But here she is working with your father, who seemed to have schooled her very rigorously. With Probably her most father, yes. Most, yes. Carolyn there with your Actually, grandfather. They, they had a terrible... She sort of broke away from her father and always sort of was the, the one who seemed to disappoint him a lot. And then after his death, she ended up dressing in his clothes and whatnot. And, and her work, I think, sort of took off from N.C. White. And they're... Hi, I don't know how, where you are, but her work was very primitive in a funny sense. I mean, very sort of these shapes and so forth, and highly personal. I think they're extraordinary paintings, and uh, someday she'll get her due. I think she's been hurt by the fact that her last name is Wyeth, mm. and people sort of expect to see you know, great detail and so forth. And uh, uh, they're very interesting. And I, as a child, uh, when I was sort of my father felt that I should go, and, and she had a sort of class in my grandfather's studio, and so she made me sit and just do black and whites of spheres and pyramids, which I loathed because I already was painting away. But it was terrific. I mean, it really gave me sort of fundamentals. And then I'd watch her paint, and she squirted the oil out of tubes. My father worked in temper, so it was very dry medium. And I fell in love with oil really by watching her oil on the palette, you know. So she had a huge influence. Mm -hmm. And here's and one. I stole from her. From well, we've got Phyllis <laughs> catching the snowflakes, but I think in a very, such an imaginative way. This has been, in, in the tour, some people's just favorite image in the whole uh, show. Uh, uh, so dynamic of, of Phyllis actively there on the back road. I think in, loosely inspired by Maine, would you say? Uh, you yes, think? definitely in Maine. And, and uh, the snow coming down and... Um, Phyllis on her sticks and so forth. So it's sort of all the exuberance and whatnot. But again, I think the Carolyn Wyeth influence is very strong in the trees and so forth. But I think, you know, stealing from your family isn't bad. No. You know. I think it's completely a good idea. So here's your mother. We have Sandspit um, painted by your father hanging outside the Torf Gallery. So if you haven't had a chance to see it, I hope you will. And this is a very recent work, which I, on the right, have only seen in reproduction. But maybe you'll tell us a little bit about this. We have it illustrated well, on the, the label. Well, the painting of my father's was done, of course, when my mother was probably in her 30s. And so I remember him painting it, going over to this Sandspit. And over the years, my mother, she created this amazing lighthouse she restored where I now live. And as well. And so it was sort of her creation, this work. Where, and so I just decided I wanted to do a record of this. And, you know, clearly she's now 93. She's certainly aged from that. And so I used my father's image of her and really aged it. Then I got my mother to pose. And uh, so it's a highly personal painting, a little odd now that I see it. But, but it's... Uh, <laughs> But anyway, it, well, I love a lot the mist back there. here. This very lavender mist and these really dynamic, uh, this foliage that seems to yeah. have a life of its own here in the it foreground. Does. That's why I say it's a very, it's, <laughs> it's a loaded painting. There are lots of things going on in it, and and you know, it's hard for me to look at things. Once I, I mean, I just drain myself on these things, and that's all while I'm working on all I think about, and then finally, I always feel I reach a point of diminishing return and and just sort of say, enough, and then leave it and walk out. So coming back, having the exhibition here, it's a great honor, but it scares the hell out of me. I can't go to work. 
This one has also been attracting so much attention. I think people have a hard time believing that you at 17 painted Shorty, mm -hmm. and it's just such an extraordinary work with the uh, relatively small and diminutive, but very powerful. And we have it here with, we, you had said one of your favorite artists early on was Copley. Yes. And we have great Copleys that people can see in the gallery. So we wanted to juxtapose a few of these paintings. This was, <laughs> this was I, 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 there was a farm near where I was raised and I spent all my time. I'd go down the railroad tracks at this farm and, and I discovered this man living along the railroad tracks. He was sort of a bum and whatnot who had worked in the railroad. So I started doing drawings and then asked him what he posed. We had not a clue what posing was. And I just had gotten my driver's license, so I was able to pick him up at 16 and bring him to the studio. And so I started this portrait that I was very excited about, and he had these long hair and so forth. He came one morning, and he always wore railroad caps, sat down in the chair, took off his hat, and he'd shaved his head the night before. <laughs> and I said, Shorty, I've been working, and he, had, he was clueless, you know. It didn't bother him. him, you know. And so I tore it up and then did this. And Copley also did this one on the right at 17, so two of our... Oh, is that right? Yes, that was and this is Sunday? his half-brother, Henry Pelham, who was in a model in his household that would be willing to sit for him, and oh, he sent it off to uh, England to ask, you know, hoping he would be able to secure a position yes. for himself at the Royal Academy. And then in those, in, at that time, Sir Joshua Reynolds did review it and said, well, it's great. Uh, we, we, we think you're making progress in the colonies, but it's too liney. That was the criticism they leveled. And of course, imagine? he taught himself. So right. as a young man, he did end up, of course, leaving and training sure. there. Um, but this shorty, uh, he posed in the studio next to my father's, the room that I used. And as I've just told you, the blaring rock Menonoff and Sibelius, that's why I think he has that shell shock face, you know, reverberating <laughs> in the room. So. Uh, so we'll go through some of these others, just some of the inspirations of the Ghent altarpiece that your mentor, Lincoln Kirstein, unearthed in yes. this part of the monuments, men, and that iconic, the look of, I just wanted to show this because it's... And so he took my father to see this painting in Washington. You know, they brought it back to Washington and... My father, and he remembered it was covered with salt dust. You know, this from the salt mines in the, in the mines, salt yeah. mines. And uh, the museum, of course, doesn't have the Ghent altarpiece, which lives in Ghent, in uh, Belgium. But uh, this one is one we have upstairs with Roger van der Weyden, Saint Luke painting the Virgin, which I just people want to look at that style of realism. But that iconic head-on, which is so rare for portrait painters. Uh, also, Helen Tausig, a great favorite of our audience, is here since she was born in Boston really powerful image that you did at a very young age. Well, this was my first commission. I, I realized that I was interested in portraiture, so I probably would do commission portraits as much as it horrified me. And I chose the least interesting face. They sent me a Karsh photograph of Tausig. It was just the worst. So I thought, and I'd never been to Cape Cod, and so I drove down there, rented a little place, and then met her, and of course she was this great, tall, striking woman. And I ended up doing, as I saw her, and I thought it wasn't a cruel portrait. Well, when this thing was shown to the people that had commissioned it, all these doctors who'd been, she'd been the mentor, they drew back in horror, and a lot of them burst into tears and said, what has this monster child done to our thing? And so it was going to be destroyed. They gave it to her. She hid it in the attic. And then now it's come around. The head of Hopkins now looks at it every morning for inspiration and whatnot. And, and it was more about, I think, as I look back on that, it was about women in medicine, and they wanted women to look like Betty, or, you know, a, a sweet person. And yeah. Talzig was not a sweet, but she was an intense, wonderful person, but very intense. And, and uh, it's so interesting to see the evolution of a painting that I struggled over and everybody just hated and now it's sort of deified in Hopkins. It's fascinating. And they were actually at the opening, uh, the representative from Hopkins. To give was, me an apology. Yes, and is... wrote officially a formal apology uh, to the museum as well, saying yeah. how thrilled they were it was reproduced. And it's the first time it's making an appearance at a museum yes. in the time since you painted it at the age of 17. So that's quite an accomplishment. Um, here's Lincoln Kirstein from the back as you chose to paint him in one of the studies. And it as, as I, we were reading about, he had an idea that you might paint something between maybe Aikens and uh, Cop and Sargent for him. Yeah. Pop, these are MFAs, Sargents, uh, and uh, um, the Aikens. But ended up, I think, looking a bit more like this yeah. man, the Copley of Samuel Adams, who's extremely leonine. But what a creative way to think of somebody from the back like well, that. Well, that's as I saw him. I mean, Kirsten was this towering figure from Boston originally. 
who then created the New York City Ballet, and then, uh, did, I mean, it was a huge art philanthropist, but disliked people, and was very difficult with people, just wouldn't talk with them. And at the ballet, he would stand backstage watching their performance, watching Balanchine, and if you approach him, he'd walk away. I mean, and he was dressed in his uniform, a black suit, white shirt, and black tie. So to me, that, that sort of epitomized uh, uh, Lincoln to me, and he, he wrote that he posed for 300 hours, which I think is kind of nonsense, but anyway. But a he lot was of a hours. great... I think 180 was he, what we wrote, but that's still a lot of hours. But he was Very a great uh, force in my life, and just really extraordinary man. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I think... And now the National Gallery in London, they have this as a poster when it was lent there for a year and so forth. So it's sort of taken on um, a life of zone. You know, so I was... Uh, <laughs> Years ago, I was asked to do a portrait of our ambassador to the court of St. James, and, and so I thought, oh my God, and the, he said, you promised you'd do it, or his wife said. So over I went, and for days, this thing ended up, kept looking like one of his dogs and whatnot, and <laughs> an official portrait has to kind of look like the person, and so I was struggling over this thing, and I had dinner with a British painter friend of mine who told me the wonderful story again of Picasso how with the Gertrude Stein portrait he worked for years on the portrait, finally presented it and everybody drew back in horror and said, and somebody said, Pablo, it doesn't look like her. And he said, it will. <laughs> <laughs> and she is remembered only for that portrait. Well, here's another very yeah. memorable, and I think one that is everybody's enjoying in the exhibition of Warhol, head-on, like Helen Tausig, uh, so dramatic, and a time when you were spending a great deal of time in the factory and exchanging portraits together. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and he let me do this, you know. I mean, I mean, he would keep saying, "Oh, Jamie, too much pimple paint and whatnot," because he was a person very affected by looks, and he'd spend an hour in the morning making up and putting his wig on and so forth. And so I wanted to do, as I saw him, almost a deer in the headlights. And, you know, most sitters would have jumped up in the middle of this and said, are you crazy? I'm not going to pose for that. And he thought it was wonderful. He said, do it exactly that way. And, uh, of course, they, he was asked at the opening when we showed these by a reporter, you know, if you owned the part, what would you do it? He said, I put it in the closet. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but he does he get you really captured him with that surprised look on his face that he was always the one it seems focusing on everyone else well he others. had great curiosity and you know Warhol of course his resonance still today fascinates me but but what I think the great quality of all his work his books his films and whatnot he had an amazing sense of wonder and as much as these strange type queens coming in and out of his life all these sort of transvestites everything was oh my god and as we were working, we loved toys and we'd spent a lot of time in toy stores. He told me as a child, when he was very ill, bedridden, his favorite toys were paper dolls. Mm -hmm. well, if you look at his portraits, they're all paper dolls. Yes. You know, they're all cut out. Very silhouetted, mm -hmm. very exact. Yes, definitely. Well, also these tableaux that are inspired by your life at the factory, and here we have in New York City, La Côte Basque with... Well, yeah, and I did these, a lot of people think I did these sort of as doll houses or whatever, but they really were sort of working tools for me, and I had gone back and revisited some of these things, so I needed a physical thing, so I actually carved the heads and the hands on the G.I. Joe figures, and then okay. dressed them and so forth, and, and created Fred Hughes, who was Andy's sort of manager and whatnot. And again... You know, paintings are miniature worlds to me when I work. And I thought, well, why not do it in the physical and do a miniature world? And, and I think it has a strange quality. And it's, it seems to be the people that come here have been fascinated. Oh, very it, much you know. so. And I think the way you even, you know, having you able to look through the top and in through the, yeah. in the, in through the um, center of the, of the tableau. So tableau vivant, for translation, would be living paintings in right. French for people right. thinking about it. And but actually it, the painting in the background here is a painting that Andy had in the dining room. And it was this wonderful painting by Forrester, a British painter who's sort of forgotten today. Wilson, yeah. Wilson, Forrester Wilson. And uh, so I tried to buy it at his auction, thinking it would sell for nothing. And my God, it went for like 400000 so I didn't get it. So I immediately painted a copy of it. And it there it great. is. <laughs> <laughs> And I, and I will say that, that you put on the television the, the rush from bad that's also attracted a fair amount of attention. It's two figures there uh, in the background. Well, it's Lincoln, Kirstein, and, and Rudolf Nureyev. And, uh, and then on the other side is Truman Capote, who was always there with uh, Joanna Carson. So it was, uh, again, sort of reproducing part of my life that I 
um, was fascinated by and sort of as if going back. So they were highly personal. And I wasn't, I remember you saw photographs and said, oh, these have to be in the exhibition. I thought they're a little weird and strange, but I think it's had a good response. Well, I hope that the public agrees because it really has such a rich resonance, see? Yeah, yeah. He's loving the tableau. But um, here we have on the screen just some art. So, so in, up at the Bowdoin College collection, Winslow Homer's mannequins that are about 12 inches high, of course they look enormous on the screen here, were ones that he used in Color Coats England when he was there yeah, exactly. posing them in his back uh, garden, which was walled, so he could figure out what he wanted to do when he actually got out on the right. seascapes there. So these are dressed as the Color Coats fisherwomen would have been, and he presumably dressed them. These are right. two surviving. And in our own museum, we don't, so we don't own the two Homer mannequins. They're jointed like artists' mannequins. And, but Degas working on a half-scale size, and, and work that's had such tremendous resonance for the Surrealists and all sorts mm. of people, with its real, originally real um, ribbon and the real tutu for the well, tulle you know, skirt. When he exhibited that, it's the only time he exhibited a piece of sculpture, the wax of the this, wax in model. which it had hair and a real tutu. Um, it was attacked as being, yes. this is absurd, you know, yes. you're just imitating life. It was far too real at the time. Yeah. And it used, even he went to the French puppeteer to get the puppet hair to put yeah. on, on the 14-year-old. This, of course, is cast later, so hence 22 after um, Degas died in 1917. And just, I mean, again, for, for some of our visitors, artists in the Surrealists like Duchamp working on small scales, putting these all into a suitcase a little bigger than this laptop we're sitting in front of, but replicas, miniatures of his own work that I he made. I wasn't aware of this. I'm fascinated by this. What did he say about it? Why did he do it? Just well, to... I think he felt that, you know, fleeing Europe as he did, he wanted to have these records in small scale. Other people him. think that inspired by the Stettheimer dollhouse that he was quite, he painted some small things for... Uh, Eddie Stettheimer for her house that's at the Museum of oh New York. God. And she had all the great artists of the day paint small scale right. for the um, room. But this one, it, it survives, and you can see he worked on it but you know, from 35 to 41, so it was a serious immersion right. on his uh. part. And so here, the urinal, our mud, and the bachelor <laughs> strip bear, the, the bride strip bear by her bachelors at Philadelphia, the two me that's at Yale, and so all of these works so that he could keep them and, yeah, and sure. really actually take them with him. Oh, it looks wonderful. I can't wait to see So this we'll take one of the, we don't have one yeah. at the MFA, but you can yeah. take a look at one at the Met. And of course, Joseph Cornell. Cornell, who Lincoln of, was a great sort of supporter of and, and encouraged him. And that again, the miniature within a box and the whole, uh, it just fascinated me. And, uh, and uh, is this in the museum? Do you this own one this? This one is. This is in uh, our collection. We have several, uh, and this is one of them. And I think it, also that you collect shadow boxes is fascinating. I don't have any images of those, but yeah. real sort of naturalist. But how artists cont in the contemporary realm are scaling up, scaling down, and, and more successful in some cases than others. This is Ai Weiwei at the Biennale, and these tableau of resin, sort of ha uh, not quite full scale life at the Brooklyn Museum recently, which mm -hmm. you haven't had a chance to see, but we mm -hmm. talked a little bit about these, uh, people looking in them so you get a sense of how they scale. Of course, Jeff Koons, in his retrospective, well-known with the Play-Doh, uh, something that took him 10 years to figure out how to cast in aluminum. Uh, there it is at the Whitney. Very different from the quality of when you reduce something, I think how intense the yeah. realism becomes as opposed to It's something. interesting, you know, people call Kuhn's sort of the Warhol of our time. And I think uh, Kuhn's work is interesting, but it's very cool and very kind of analytical. Back again to what I said about Warhol, I think his things, why they still resonate, is there a sense of wonder in these things. Yes. I mean, when he did Elizabeth Taylor, he loved Elizabeth Taylor and that painted face and so forth. Um, I mean, Coons is fascinating, but it's very cool and cool. He, I think, and, to me, I mean, having been to the retrospective recently, it seems he's really just absorbed Duchamp and Warhol and figured yeah. out how is he going to make his uh, mark by really re recasting them yes. quite, quite slickly. So while this in person is, it's quite fascinating. My sister and I saw it together, and she's an artist, and so we were sort of, you know, it, it grabs you in terms of you're wondering how it's made, but beyond that, it doesn't, I don't He actually, much. one of his best, I think, a really great thing he did is called Bubbles, which is Michael Jackson with his in chimpanzee. Ceramic. And that is pretty remarkable. And, you know, I ended up doing a drawing of Michael Jackson. He came to Chad's Ford and to meet my father and I. This is when he had just done Thriller, and he was still childlike and beautiful looking. 
And of course, my father kept thinking it was Jesse Jackson, had not a clue <laughs> who Michael Jackson was. I guess he, he had the wrong. Um, well, he actually did, and, and Koontz did a ceramic pig, so I wondered, Jamie, how much of your work he'd seen. I didn't bring a slide of it. Um, but on to Nureyev, and, and I just wanted to bring along, these are just extraordinary nude drawings on um, mid-tone board. Uh, but we have a great, this great sergeant nude of Thomas McKellar, who was the model for him for the murals here at the MFA Boston uh -huh. Honda. And he recruited, as the story goes, McKellar, he was working as an elevator operator here uh -huh. in Boston. And he's got, in this particular, very sketchy work, these um, wings, almost like Ganymede, behind him here. Uh -huh. But he posed for both the men and the women in the murals. And it's on the Nureyev thing. It was sort of fascinating. I was recalling the other night, um, um, Nureyev, when he defected in Paris, everybody went to Paris to see him. And among the people was Richard Avenon who, as Rudolph told me, he got to me very drunk, and I posed for him. Well, what he posed were in these wonderful positions of Nijinsky and the sort of, as if he was Modern, a Greek right vase astray. and whatnot. Well, Rudolph flew into rage. Somebody told him, you'll be defected and sent back to Russia. And so he had um, um, Avedon give him the photographs. And, and so after Rudolph died, a friend of mine in England said, there's things coming up for sale outside of London. And among them was this photo strip and they're amazing photographs of Nureyev in the nude Posing. by Avedon. And um, Robert Wilson, you know, the, yes. the playwright, is working on this film about my father and I. And, and he came to the house and saw these and said, you know, I want, I want those, a copy mm. of those. And, uh, That's great. And we have I to said, look at those. I don't those. think so. And just, you know, the numbers of studies that you did for this in 1977 of him, again, on that mid-tone, I think giving such great resonance to the whites and the blacks. Well, and he was such an incredible figure. And, and, you know, yes, an amazing dancer, but as a human being, he would come and visit us at the farm. And it was like having a panther in the house. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't male, he wasn't female, he was an animal. And, <laughs> and so many performers... Off stage, they're rather disappointing. Nureyev was exactly as he was on stage, off stage. This amazing, intense figure. And so, I mean, I spent a year just doing endless things of him. And purely out of, I first followed him around, did things, and he said, I have no time. And then I, so I got a guy at the City Ballet to pose for his figure. And, and I said one day at class, when he was, when Nureyev was taking class, that I have this figure posing for you, and of course Rudolf said, what, those pig legs for me? No, that pig, that poor guy's now a salesman on Iowa, I'm sure, at the end of his career. <laughs> but then the ref let me follow him everywhere, on stage, when he went alone on stage before a performance, he said you could sit there in silence and draw. And it kind of gave me a whole different thing of this remarkable man. Mm -hmm. And so many different uh, emotions, I think, expressed. And just to remind people that when even an artist like Sargent is working on a motif as a dancer, and we do have one version of the three of this scene of Rosina dancing out in, on the island of Capri, and if you look at them, well, even on the screen here, you'll see how he's modified uh, the architecture, the moonlight, and of course the coloration on the tambourine. But again, uh, practicing again and again, which I mm -hmm. think you talk about on screen in the film with Darcy Marsh, saying like a pianist or anyone practicing sure. over and over again to get the motif down in a way that it's like second nature. And, and if you're obsessed with something, I mean, why not do 20 of it? I mean, certainly Warhol did it, 20 soup cans. And so I think, you know, it's all what your interest is, you know. And we have, you know, just a longer tradition of the Dutch trony. Now, these are not the, the array of heads. I had two Dutch visitors on one of my tours, and they were very specific that those... I said, trony means really face, a study of the face. And I mentioned that we had one upstairs. It was popular in Rembrandt's circle of Leiden in the 17th century. But it's more, more something artists did as a show of mastery of a certain style of uh -huh. uh, painting or emotion. Uh, studies of emotion of all ages, young and old. And the Dutch people said, well, nowadays it means really only for aberrants. It's only for criminals and all of that. So that I Good now am corrected to just say Incredible. it's really faces. And we have yeah. also this wonderful um, Winslow Homer in our collection in the print room. You'd have to go make an appointment if anyone wanted to see it. It's not out on view, but it has been on view. Yeah, I actually started using the tone paper as Homer did. I didn't really totally steal from him. Um, when I first worked <laughs> with Warhol, you know, he had this very pale white skin, and so I thought better to do the contrast, and so that's when I started using uh, opaque white and so forth. And then with Nureyev, who, when I first began working with him, he was doing Pierrot Lunaire, 
And so the makeup was all white makeup. And so again, these liquid eyes and this white face and lipstick, it was fantastic. And so we have the purple scarf in the show, which yeah. we don't have on the screen here. Uh, and I think um, it's just exactly what you say, so dynamic. Well, he would, and, and of course, the purple scarf I did because we would, some, when he was doing a matinee, he would do the midday performance, and then rather than take off his makeup, he often would just walk out of the stage door or exit wearing his makeup. Well, of course, it would stop people on their tracks on the street, you know, because he had this presence, you know. I am Nareev, and you are nobody. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was, uh, uh, Another one of the great moments, I think, in the show are the range of birds, particularly this enormous raven that's really... <laughs> beyond uh, scale, it's, it's huge, five feet by, or six I feet I just by. had finished this painting, and I took it, went to, I had an exhibition in Alaska, and Senator Ted Stevens, who was a wonderful friend of ours, took me around, and, well, the Eskimos and Inuits, the raven comes back as their ancestors, so they deify the raven. And, of course, they thought I'd done the painting for them. And so I sort of went along with it, and then <laughs> Stevens had to fly back to Washington, so he said, I have to give a speech to the Inuit and Eskimo Council. You give it. And I thought, what am I going to talk to the Eskimos about? And then I realized the whole incarnation of birds and animals, and it was fascinating. I'm sure you they loved it. could have heard a pin it. drop on the audience. So 1980 and then 1998, here they are strutting along on the ice storm. And Still it, obsessed with ravens, yes. And I think, having just seen them, they were strutting all over Paris in the Jardin de Tuileries. They were, really have this very funny walk. Yeah. Uh, and I was surprised because I had never really remembered seeing a lot of ravens. In oh, they're wonderful. Now I have them back on the island, and I'm just so thrilled because they're very sketchy birds. You only get about 10 feet from them. Very bright and... And they're just fascinating, and the whole iconography of them and whatnot just intrigues the hell out of me. So this is sort of symbolic, and there's an ice storm on my island in Maine, and the, the intense blues and so forth. It just, uh, just thrilled me, it made my hair go on end, so I worked on that. I did an, a number of versions of this. And this one's on cardboard, so a number of... This is on different. cardboard, and um, again, cardboard came out of working with Nereev. I wanted to get larger works, and so I tore up all these things that brought the costumes and the sets. And, you know, this was a larger scale. And then I got fascinated. Here I'm doing the world of ballet, which is so kind of ethereal and so forth. And I'm doing it on cardboard. You know, it's kind of a wonderful Great juxtaposition. Great juxtaposition. I think you make a lot yeah. of those kinds of jarring kinds of juxtaposition. When we first met, we talked about this painting, which hung at Shelburne Museum, uh, that your father had initially in your home. It was doing service for something entirely different. <laughs> well, he did this painting and, and worked endlessly on it. I barely remember. But, and he showed it to his father, who was... Uh, still living. Of course, I wasn't even born. What am I saying? And the father thought, Andy, what are you, why would you do a vulture and so forth? So that winter, my brother, my older brother, had as a Christmas present a railroad set. So my father took the painting, flipped it over, and put tracks on the back of the painting. And months later, Maxim Karolik, a lot of the reflection here in Boston, mm -hmm. was given by him, came to look at my father was desperate to sell a painting, pulled out everything, nothing interested him. He went down the cellar, flipped off the trains off the thing, brought it up, and Carolyn said, a masterpiece. And, uh, and that, of course, it ended up in Shelby. It did. A long story there, but a fascinating, I think, one. It was on Masonite, so just so you know, it wasn't canvas. It was easier to flip because yeah. it was hard. Um, but on a... I troll around on eBay, as you know, from time to time. This postcard of someone who had seen Soaring thought it was actually carved in wood. And so hence the Bellamy Eagle here I brought along because you not only collected, but your mother My mother, a huge collection of Bellamy. Yes, really discovered Bellamy when people thought, well, he was just a bird carver. And she learned through various people that his studio was being torn down down in the Farmington, Maine. And so she went there and bought all his drawings, all the things and gave, ended up giving me some of them. And I think he's one of the great carvers of, uh, I mean, they're just iconic. There's a wonderful exhibition right yes, now. Yes, right now at the Portsmouth Historical, Portsmouth Historical Society. Society. Up it's in a major Portsmouth, exhibition New Hampshire. Of and catch it before, I think, end We're of October it, yeah. it closes. Um, so the object has such an interesting place in your work. And again, this one, this watercolor, uh, has a lot of people have commented to me, they always find it hard to believe at 13 you climbed to the top of a tower <laughs> to render. It's a relatively large watercolor, and one artist I was with said, well, it's quite a large sheet. How did he get to the top of the tower to get that I, view? I was so excited because I knew the tower was going to be torn down. So I thought, let me do a painting from the top of the... And they'll never know how I did it. 
That was my main <laughs> And I love how the weather vane really pushes above the trees here. And, and again, people have thought the, the palette, the sort of monochromatic subdued palette from your father, but yes. the view is so different because you're looking up and you're looking down at that same, in this uh, same scene. So unlike soaring where one is really flying in the view of those uh, no, I, turkey buzzards. You know, buzzards. as a child, Elliot, all I did was paint. I mean, still is all I do, so I'm kind of a boring person. But, but back then, I was crawling all over our roofs of our houses doing from different views, and so I just was obsessed. Yeah, it's fascinating, and, and I think the way the objects appear. Um, these are really great scenes of Phyllis, the first finished portrait of Phyllis that, that I know of, at least, um, not the one of the leaves, which I think uh -huh. is still one that, that is still working on, perhaps, or at least Mary Beth Dolan <laughs> says is still. Uh, but this one of 75, and, you know, I think, again, when... Um, seeing these, I think visitors, these have such long tradition of artists painting carriage, like uh, our own here at the MFA Boston from uh, the work of Degas and how radical this must have seemed in the 1870s with the horses shorn off at their knees and at the edge of this. And then this very strange scene of what is going on here. This baby looks like it's about to faint but away. But you know, when I, I looked at this painting just earlier today, if you look in the background, the horses, are anatomically, a horse can't do that, stretch no. out like that. And you can almost date it Mybridge, the photographer, yes. started doing more locomotion, animal stop motion so photographs, strobe, strobe and photos. it totally influenced Degas. He yes. saw them and completely changed his, uh, his paintings of horses. Completely. So these are the rocking horse years, as we think about it, where they're stretched out from the yeah. English prints. Are they until, called the rocking horse Well, we, we call it in the print world, you know, sort of right. the rocking horse scenes, because when you often see a rocking horse, it's right. supported on a rocker this way, but the English sporting prints often yes. showed horses. Of course. of course, horses don't race this way. I'm sure we'll get Phyllis to confirm that for us with the 2012 Union Rag Stakes winner. Yeah. Um, here from the behind, another great one in our collection that seems Wonderful, to have been fascinated yes. by and how the horses fit into the landscape and sort of get, get dominion, more diminutive as they get I'm just, I think he's such a versatile painter, Degas. I mean, the way he, you know, and here in your museum you have next to it a very free thing. It's hard mm -hmm. to believe that the same man did yes, it. Yes, one of the ballet I mean, dancers. This is so delicately painted. I mean, it's just... And then all of a sudden he'd be to something totally free and loose and whatnot, which is, of course, the strength of his work. I think he was just And while he was doing these, he was, of course, also modeling these in wax in small in scale. In wax that nobody saw. He exactly. did them for his own eyes. And after his death, as you know, they went into his atelier, and here were all these, these wonderful uh, pieces of wax around. I mean, just amazing. So we have no. Phyllis from behind here in one of the uh, three driving scenes in the yeah, show. Yeah, I just uh, ended up painting Phyllis constantly. She sort of been amused, and there's one of our dogs leaning into the corner, and so on. And I actually sat on the back of her carriage, there's sort of a groom seat, and did endless drawings and work as she would drive through the woods on these things. So it was uh, participatory. I mean, you know, I really was part of it. And in 1987, it's an amazing thing to think of working on something as complex, but with such a long tradition going right. back, I think. You know, this carriaging thing is done in our areas. You know, we have Phyllis's cousin start driving and so forth. I, told you about the Michael Jackson, that day that he came, I called Frolic and said, uh, Michael Jackson's here, can you take him for a carriage ride? So we went over, and Frolic had this big foreign hand, and Jackson sat next to him, of course, in all the braids and the <laughs> glove and whatnot. Well, we came around a corner, it was in the spring, and there were these fishermen standing fishing. Well, they looked up, <laughs> there's Michael Jackson <laughs> on a carriage. And so they ran after the carriage, their lines are going, Zzz! saying, Brother Michael, Brother Michael. <laughs> <laughs> so Frau like stopped the carriage. And of course they were like, what? And he was, oh, hi. And then the little <laughs> things. <laughs> You never know what's going to happen in Chad's Ford, which is where the show goes next. So we'll have to see. It starts there in January, so we'll have to keep an eye out for yeah. maybe an appearance, a reappearance of Michael Jackson. Um, winter scenes, these great Brandywine spiders. And we also have on view in our galleries Horace Pippin, who is a Brandywine painter, and he's about Brandywine to be painter. a big show, a show at the Brandywine River Museum next April. It, there we is are lending uh, the, this one to the show. Oh, so. great. And my father was sort of discovered yes. Pippin. He, um, 
my grandfather went to an exhibition, so he's a very primitive painter who lived in Westchester, Pennsylvania. And I think they're extraordinary. Paintings. They really are. I think actually your Aunt Carolyn seems to share a lot yeah, of very similar sensibility. Similarity, yeah. So Pippin was injured um, during the war and uh, and had an injured arm, so he used this as therapy. He didn't start painting until yes. he was in his early 40s no, and produced some extraordinary work, including this one yeah. in the museum's collection. And this one, uh, I love Bale, um, a work it sounds like you spent many, many uh, weeks working on. Careful. Well, and I consider the, uh, this to me as a portrait, too. I mean, this is as much of a portrait as the Nureyev portrait. Uh, in that, uh, that bail, for some odd reason, uh, that's all I dreamed about, all I thought about. It was in our field. I covered it carefully with a sheet every night, thinking that something would happen to it, and became totally obsessed with it and, and did it with the same intenseness. Um, I, I, one great moment was when I was near finishing this, the farmer who lives in the farm next door happened to come through our farm. So I said, Ed, come on in, I just finished a painting. Might be interested in saying. So he came and he looked. He said, When did you get the John Deere Baylor? <laughs> <laughs> that was That's the best realism. compliment I've ever That's had. realism. <laughs> yes. Um, and I love, this one is so made, it's so carefully made, if you have to go up and see it in the gallery, so each stroke and the way that the grasses are sheared off and you see these kind of small orbs, and circ uh, um, concentric circles. And we, I brought along here today, this one we looked at this just earlier, yes, a little bit earlier, this great it. Rufus Porter wall. Uh, Rufus Porter, a self-taught artist who worked up, well he's actually worked a lot here in Massachusetts near Westwood, not far west Mostly from here. Mostly New Hampshire. New think, Hampshire, yeah, yeah. this is from Jaffrey, New Hampshire, a house there, uh, in a, a tavern rather, where he was trading his painting for room and board. And so he's got stenciling along the border here. He's even stenciled the little squirrels in. This but is a it, great piece, I must say. I was really struck wonderful. by it today. I think it's wonderful. But he's so counter to type. A lot of people think of folk artists as being not uh, very sophisticated. He founded Scientific American. He thought of all kinds of uh, very forward things. You know, the revolving ri rifle was his invention, not sure, Colt's, but exactly. he sold it to Colt. No, fascinating And figure. you collect work by and Porter. Primitivism, I don't really know about primitives. It's like Rousseau, the French painter. I went to an exhibition in Paris years ago, and there were early Rousseaus, which were very kind of orthodox paintings of street scenes. Mm. I mean, he sort of adopted this uh, yes. primitive sort of thing. So, you know, so are these people primitive? I don't right. know. Right. He could paint in any way he wanted to, and he actually published books on to help Americans learn how to paint. But this is how he chose to paint, and I think this is yeah. what people often forget about. But for the rectangle and sort of the carefully made of course, uh, you would comment on seeing these at Leo Castelli's in 1964 when they first appeared. and you found Sure, them. and these were hand-painted. I mean, he decided to reproduce them just by hand and so forth. And it, I mean, they're sort of iconic in a way, you know? I mean, I think with Warhol, you take the whole body of his work, and he was, you know, a fascinating, intense individual who you take his films and take, they all, it's an amazing effort. Um, you know, and he had an enormous influence on me. I mean, I just by his tuning in on ordinary objects and, and almost deifying a box, a cardboard box. Well, why not? How wonderful. Not? No, they're incredible. And they're also stenciled, too, like the, you know, this yeah. part of it. Um, now, in Maine, this view of your now studio there on Monhegan, um, the former home of Rockwell Kent. Rockwell Kent, yes. Which has been one of the also great icons, I think, for the show. And we brought along some other view of the Winslow Homer studio Homer and the studio, fog exactly. and sort of that very hazy Speaking look. of studios, I don't know, have you been there? It's wonderful yes. because you wonder how did he see, it's very dark in that studio. Yes. And Wilmerding tells me he thinks he worked in the screened in second sort of the floor. the second floor, That's which is jutting out. You can sort yeah. of almost see that in this painting Exactly. Here. Yeah, very... uh, but I think an extraordinary... But it's I worth think... going to see because I think it gives you an insight into Homer, don't you? Definitely. That's workspace. I think all I mean... of these studios do. I then think yeah. that's why seeing them in Brandywine, it's so oh, exciting yes. to see all the generations of studios there. Including... No, and that's why I encourage young people to go. I mean, there's a wonderful thing the National Trust has where they have workspaces where your door welty wrote all her wonderful things. And it's a little bedroom. Mm -hmm. And for a young person to see this, that within this, these four walls, she created a whole world that anybody can do. I mean, I think that's the, I mean, what is painting? It's the most individual of all the disciplines. I mean, you don't need an orchestra, you don't need an editor, you don't need sound people, light people. You know, it's a stick with a hair on the end of it and the sticky stuff called paint and cloth. And there's nothing between you and the, and the painting. So, I mean, for young people, that, interests them a lot, and I think it you know, pulls them in, I hope.
Definitely. And one more, I think we, we're maybe going to have to turn it over to some questions in a moment, but the interest in film, I think, in, in your work, this one, the, the Monhegan Schoolhouse, with the gulls in the foreground, and here's a Hitchcock film, which is chilling for anyone who's seen it. Well, it's it. kind of, and that was menacing to me, and I wanted, it actually happens every day in the school in the fall and winter, the children come out at noontime for, you know, for lunch and to eat and play, and all the gulls sit there silently waiting for them to come out. And then afterwards they fly off, and then in the evening they come back. So I, it was rather menacing, which I loved, you know. And we have, we have a lot more, but I think um, just Twin Houses on Monhegan and here um, yeah. Hopper for those who came in the summer months when we showed. But these are all Go back actually, to the Twin Houses. Sure. Kind of they were designed and built by Rockwell yes. Kent on Monhegan. And they're mere images of one another. Everything is reversed, the interior and the exterior. And he wrote me a letter saying that he left the worst mark on Manhegan, these two houses. And they're great. I love I've painted them. them many times. And I think know. they're wonderful in, in terms of looking because it yeah. makes such a setup. And I think such dynamism between the buildings, very different from here, the way Hopper's painting outside yeah. of Portland at Two Lights. Uh, and your great animals on Monhegan, the, the yeah. ram and Lady. So Lady, the portrait from 1968 with these very broad abstract bands of landscape and light behind her. And here's Bryce Martin painting the western landscape three yeah. years after you. So you wonder, did he see Lady? He might have. Where'd the sheep go? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Phyllis, uh, with one of the artists you had, had said you admired, um, Aikens, his wife there, All which right. was much criticized. I was as, almost as excited. Well, there it is in the next painting with the, the jawbone, which is a sperm whale's jawbone above her there. And here it reappears. I did a series of paintings with this young boy in Manhegan who was truly an island child, born on the island, spoke only to the seagulls and the seals and so forth. And I finally convinced him to pose. And again, the shape of this... Uh, it sort of goes back to the, the whale and the swallowing of the individual. You know, I, I, how you can get off on something, you know, completely in your mind, and yet it existed. There he is in his watch, which is a digital watch, and, and um, you know, he was sitting there watching movies on the television set, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so he kept himself occupied. Well, our, our uh, local critic, of course, likened this to Whistler, I think the arrangement in gray I don't see how and black. Connection. Um, I didn't steal I, from Whistler. No, I, I know. And I think here you had mentioned how much you enjoyed Antonio Lopez Garcia. Yes. I think the monochromatic quality of objects in his own uh -huh. space, in his sink, right. obviously. Uh, very beautiful, I think, counterpoint to the... I love the two heads you have outside yes, the entrance. Night and it's day. great of his work. He's a wonderful painter, I think. Just All great. right, so we'll go through and hear your, the, the dogs. That's one of your great paintings, but you don't own that, you said. We it's don't own it yet. Here. No, we don't. It's on loan wow. to us. It's a really terrific. It's so, I mean, showing things on screen, it's about this big. And, and Lincoln Kirsten, always, we would talk about this painting. I thought it was an enormous painting. And then you took me to see it, and there it is. Yes, it's cool. a miniature. Yeah. And I, I wanted to bring Tiller, because, again, Tiller, a little bit now hard to see in the show, and that he's in the doorway, and so the, it's not a place we normally hang work. but. Right. Um, he's hanging there, and he has this great inscription across the top, Jamie, so I thought maybe... Well, he, he um, jumped off my boat as I was coming in from the island, and I turned around, tried to reach him, and the sea was getting big, and he went down, and uh, so I dove down, got him, pulled him out, and a fisherman watched this whole thing, came and, and literally gave him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, and my God, he came too, and... Okay. So this is he and I, he posed for me and I signed it. Thank you for saving my life. That's so wonderful. And he was here with us when the show opened, which okay. is tremendous. Yeah. Um, so just Southern Island, where you are now, yeah. with these great images of these uh, cylinders Light. Sort of and, iconic and lighthouses, yeah. And here's Hopper painting outside yeah. of uh, Portland, um, and here the Pemico right. light. The right. similar building in the background, which he's not interested in at all, which you make often yeah. a lot of those yeah. great pyramidal buildings. He was the, the first fog. really to do lighthouses, you know. I mean, he definitely. Yeah. I mean, now they're sort of uh, they're sort of considered well the motif number two or something. But I mean, they're uh, they have a quality. My father, he did a wonderful painting of the uh, towards the end of his life, and he was outside working on this painting, and um, the lighthouse keeper, the guy taking care of the place, came out and kept looking at him over his shoulder. Finally, he said, as my father was finishing up, uh, come on in the house, I'll show you a real painting of this lighthouse. <laughs> and he went in, and it was a horrible calendar my father had done when he was 20 of the <laughs> lighthouse. <laughs> That's great. That's terrific. Well, 
Um, Hopper certainly well known for that. Yeah. And I think here, Hopper painting an American landscape, this etching, I know you have an impression of it, but with these cows lumbering across the railroad tracks with this peaked, very simple building in the background, which the critics at the time considered incredibly ugly. And it became for him the it's icon of American print, yeah. landscape. And I, you know, he was supposedly inspired by the maybe one cow, as you've said, grazed on Monhegan. But I, I have this print, and I love the whole thing anatomically of cows. If you ever watch them, they're sort of odd. And that, whether that was an inspiration, but this cow licking itself just fascinated me. So I ended up uh, spending two months on this painting. Well, I think this one is just cows really do that. Yeah. And I think you really captured that. Yeah. It's a wonderful piece that was on view here recently at Adelson Galleries, Boston. And here you mentioned how um, some of the edgier scenes of Maine. So I think these ones, uh, yeah, how much you has... like the edge and the angst in Maine. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, Maine, Maine has produced more terrible paintings among them, some of mine, but because it's so iconic and they're sort of, you know, emblematic and so forth. So I try to... Not that I consciously steer away from it, but there's a real angst in Maine. I mean, Maine is hard, you know, the winters are long, and, uh, and, and so I hope to get some of the edge of it, not just the pretty bucolic, oh, isn't that pretty, the seagulls and so forth. Um, and so these are kind of part of that. And the murder of crows with that severed crow, which I think has an yeah, interesting uh, are, yeah. element there. And here's one of the yeah. great Winslow Homer the late winter Winslow scenes in Incredible. Pennsylvania Academy. Wow. Um, and maybe we'll just end, with, oh, and there he is in our museum. Of yeah. course, look out all's well. Uh -huh. Very strange work. In yeah, his, uh, for one Homer. of the few sort of almost life-size figures by Homer. Definitely, in the lower yeah, foreground. And here, a um, fairly recent work, 2013, of the series you're working on now. Well, I was uh, um, fascinated by Rockwell Kent, and really um, that brought me to Minhegan, and so I collected a lot of his Minhegan paintings, which are very rare to find. They're all in Russia. And so there's sort of a story. I'm doing a series of uh, untoured occurrences on Minhegan Island, and one of the occurrences, Kent came back as a... He'd been accused of being a communist and so forth. So he came back to the island. Everybody hated him. And then he left the island, and his secretary, who probably was his lover, ended up either falling off the cliff or being pushed off the cliff. And uh, so if you look up in the mm -hmm. corner, there's right the body here. dropping. Because of this painting, they reopened the investigation, the attorney general in Maine. Everybody's dead, you know. It's kind of absurd, but... Um, but sometimes, you know, life imitates art. And uh, anyway, I was so influenced by this, I did the trees almost as if, and here's your great Ken mm -hmm. of the museum, and my God, there I am, stealing again. Yeah, no, it's not stealing. I think, you know, all art has got all kinds of things in <laughs> literature, every version. This was of pretty intentional, though. I wanted to do it as if I had painted, if I were Kent painting. And actually, when I did this, the face, I sort of imagined what he looked like in that period. And I was halfway finished with the painting, and somebody sent me an early photograph of Ken, and it looked exactly like that. It scared the hell out of me. Yeah, definitely. You know, these eyes it's very intense. And, and painting. So it's interesting, of all the artists in the show, your father, you painted Warhol, this is the one who's actually painting with a palette right, right. into our space almost, yeah. sort of putting it right out there. Uh, yeah. Just some other ideas. And here... The, maybe we'll end here close to this in the inferno of all of your seven deadly sins. And here's Audubon. They're all clustered together. I think they're so graphic, Jamie, this flock together yeah. in, the, in the gallery. I think they have a real intensity. Oh, well, it scares me you put it with Audubon. But, because I, Audubon is so far beyond ornithological painters. And I think why he's far beyond is he lifts it into something else. Mm -hmm. You don't care that it's a bird or a gull or whatever. It's so amazingly, the whole design of it, the whole mm -hmm. structure of it, um, you know, that had a huge influence on me. And, and then, and yet he was an ornithologist. He mm -hmm. wanted to be accurate. And these gull paintings of mine, when I got sort of excited about gulls and they would sleep in the same area where I was working, they're so used to me now. And so, you know, again, back to the emblematic thing in Maine, sweet seagulls look like doves. Well, they're not. They're mm. terrifying birds. I grabbed one one day, and he went right for my eye to take out my eye. And so that, coupled with the seven deadly sins, I said, they're perfect in this thing. And it really came from a dream of, of mine. And I hope... You know, I don't want to cutify these things and make them into Disney creatures. You know, look, it looks like a human. Um, I hope people realize that these are 
you know, I want them to be edgy and what gulls are about. And I think the way you've hung in this exhibition, you almost can hear them screaming. <laughs> I of course, in can. the film, you can hear them Yes, screaming. and yeah. I was going to say, here we have uh, the, yeah. the inferno. And this was something, this I didn't hoke up. This is on Manhegan, which is politically incorrect now, but we used to burn our trash out there. And that's an oil tank they cut a hole in. And Orca's brother would throw the garbage in there, and the gulls came down to get it, and then they'd pull away from the fire, and this beautiful angelic kid pushing. It was something out of Wagner. Mm, and you know, I'd be painting this thing, and painters would come out on the mailboat, strewn with cameras to photograph the lobster boys. And here was this incredible drama going on. It's amazing. You know, this amazing world of an island and a child, and as I say, something out of Dante's Inferno. Well, know. the other thing is, you know, flames are actually really hard to paint. Flames in the sea, I mean, those elements, mm. fire and water. I mean, we have a few here on view. This is Pollock on a blank bowl, a ceramic bowl, where he's inspired by this Roscoe painting that was on uh, a fresco in an orphanage in Guadalajara. So it's just, it's really difficult. I mean, look at how these two are even struggling with the figure in flames. And I think that's... Well, the, on the flame thing, I got so carried away that it, um, the lobster boys that fishermen use, they're now using fluorescent paint. So I took some of their fluorescent paint and used it in the painting. And you can see you putting all the really sparks go. on, which yeah. looks great. Well, I couldn't resist also bringing along this from the Frick Collection. <laughs> yeah. Great view of a forge. And artists, I think, sometimes used Vulcan's forge or sort of those kinds of forge to get at the flames and sort of the figures working mm. in really dramatic ways. Yeah. Um, here's and Homer on the cliffs, but maybe we'll end here with your yeah. series of scenes of the um, yeah, sea watchers. Yeah, this is an image, a dream. This was shortly after my father died. And um, and I had this incredibly vivid dream. I was on Manhegan of walking out to the cliffs and seeing these figures standing. And then as I approached, I realized, oh my God, there's Warhol and there's my father and grandfather. And, and so then I went further with it. And, you know, it's a little strange. I mean, one of the pictures, as you know, is owned by Stephen King. So that shows you how strange it is. Yeah. Here's the second one where we've lost Homer, but we've now got Warhol. Yes, and yes I started eliminating people. And, uh, <laughs> and how freely painted. And finally, this one with just your grandfather just two, yeah. and your father on cardboard at night. So, Jamie, thank you so much. I think we're going to open it up for maybe a few questions. I know we're um, running a little bit. I think we have time for two. Okay, time for two. Thank you so much. And we'll now turn it over to the audience. I'm sorry it went so long. Good. Okay. They're going to ask you... Yes, two. I think they're going to do two. Here we go. Here's one. I can't resist asking what it was like working in the factory uh, with oh, Warhol. Anything you want to tell us about that part of your life? Um, but it, it was absolutely fascinating. I, Warhol gave me sort of a corner and, uh, and, um, that where I put up this sort of uh, barrier and whatnot, and he would come and pose and so forth. But at one point, um, a filmmaker friend of mine was doing a picture called Pumping Iron, and he brought down, he said, you have to meet this incredible actor who was Mr. Universe. And of course, it was Arnold Schwarzenegger. So down he came. Well, of course, Warhol was so excited, Mr. Universe. And then every queen in New York City, when they heard Mr. Universe was there, they came down. And of course, Arnold all thought they were women. So he would sort of start making, you know, I'll meet you later, you know, and I'd say, Arnold, it's a guy. That's, you know, but... So that's the type of thing that happened down there. But it's, uh... <laughs> Mistaken identities. Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, my my favorite um, painting of yours is the the bale, and oh, I'm nice. curious to know how you achieved it because you said it took you so long, and it was very clear that the lighting was so important to you that it would seem that you'd have to do it at the same time every day. Oh, I did. I timed it. I mean, I wanted it to be an absolute accurate portrait of a bale of hay. I mean, that's how obsessive painting can get. And and so when I see it now, I sort of wonder, what on earth was in my mind? But, you know, there you are. I think we have another one here. And this will be our final Just question. Just in, the microphone's heading your way. Hi. Um, Hi. I'm interested in hearing about your technique of working with watercolors from the tube. Oh, um, good question. On the cardboard. Yeah, um, and also you mentioned somewhere, maybe in the show here, that 
that you got your watercolors from Andy Warhol and that they have honey in them. So could you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, well, um, I, I'm a great believer you shouldn't be limited by a medium. And, and I love watercolor, but most people's perception of watercolor washes and all that. And so I thought, well, why not do it as if it's an oil? And do paint directly out of the tube and so forth. Well, then people started saying they're going to crack, they're going to chip off. And Andy had a paint maker who did paint for him, this lovely little boy and whatnot. So he came to me and said, I'm going to make up this stuff for you that I think it'll work. And, um, and so he put honey into the medium. And honey remains, as you know, it was in the pyramids when they went, and it lasts and uh, keeps in elasticity and so forth. I've gone a little further now. I have um, Golden Paints, Mark Golden, who's this guy who owns the company. He loves to experiment with young painters and people who have questions about mediums. And he has this thing called Wyeth Gel that he makes for me <laughs> that, uh, that is going to uh, keep it. But, but the main thing is, is that I, you shouldn't be restricted, I don't think, by any. And, and you know, if you look at some of the Andrew Wyeths, his dry brush medium, that was, nobody had done watercolors other than Albert Durer with that sort of... So he also believed that don't be restricted by the medium. I mean, that's baloney. You can push things as far as you want. So. Well, we thank, thank you, you so much, Jamie. And I think we're going to have a public book signing later on after a short break in the bookshop. But thank you Great. so much. Thank you. Thanks.